Hey everyone, welcome to The Agronomists. I am Lindsay Smith, your host. Uh, welcome here. It is July 11th. I kind of can't believe we're almost halfway through July. Um, and uh, I do appreciate you taking the time out of your Monday evening to join us. This is this is an episode that I am uh, pretty excited about. There's some pretty cool stuff we're going to talk about. Uh, but before, of course, I bring in my guests, uh, I do want to remind everyone watching that it, uh, for joining us this evening, you can qualify for those CEU credits. Just head on over to realagriculture.com slash agronomists. Let us know that you caught the episode and we'll make sure you get those credits uh shout out to ray and to jason so ray's out of alberta jason's in manitoba they've joined the show tonight um super exciting to see everybody I, and one of my guests did ask if peter wheat pete johnson would be in the chat but i think he is traveling home today from overseas so we might uh we might not see pete today but we'll see he's always he brings some good questions um okay of course, we want to thank our sponsors before we get rolling tonight. So tonight's show brought to you by Adama Canada, Mind Your Farm Business, and we've got a real agriculture webinar coming up uh, July 19th. Um, and uh, we'll start, of course, with a shout out to Adama Canada. While other sources of innovation run dry, Adama is here to deliver, leveraging the world's largest library of actives to provide innovative crop protection solutions to your greatest challenges. We're all in on you. Talk to your Adama sales rep today. All right, let's get to the good stuff. Tonight's topic, we are talking white mold and sclerotinia. And I put them together, yes, to make everybody out west happy and everybody in the east happy, but also because it's the same darn disease. Okay, so to tackle management of that, we've got Dave Kaminsky plant pathologist with Manitoba Agriculture, and Rob Miller with BASF joining us tonight. Uh, welcome, both of you. Thanks, Lindsay. Yep, thanks for having me. Great to All be right. back. Okay. Yes, yeah, it's been a little while. Uh, Rob, uh, if you can, remind everybody where you're based and let us know uh, how the corn and beans are looking around where you are. Yeah, so I'm based in Guelph, Ontario, Canada, but I... Uh, Everyone knows that where Guelph, Ontario, Canada is, but uh, I manage a lot of Ontario and eastern, uh, eastern Quebec, and even all the way down to the Maritimes as well. So it's, uh, um, I haven't been out to Manitoba yet, but I also work with our specialists out in Manitoba on corn, soybeans as well. Very cool. All right. And um, did the Guelph area get any rain? Because I am here very dry. West yeah, <laughs> we we are very dry. We're still not bad, but uh, definitely we could use a rain. Um, you know, I was down in the sand plains of Norfolk County last week, and yeah, they're definitely a lot drier. But it almost seems the further north you go, um, you know, up around Lake Huron, Georgian Bay, they seem to be getting a, a few more rain events. Um, so overall, I would say the crop actually looks a little bit better the further north you go um, in central Ontario. Um, down in the sand, you know, they're they're in desperate need. Guelph is still not bad. We still could use hopefully one of these pop-up thunderstorms that gives a nice gentle shower over the next little bit. Um, but overall, we're still okay, but we, we definitely need a rain here in the next uh, few days to save this crop and get that high mm -hmm. yield potential. Yeah, the corn's looking a little bit sad. Yeah. Soybeans don't care yet. It's fine. Yeah, um, still, no, early. <laughs> still early. Yeah. All right, Dave, and you're out in Manitoba. Uh, definitely been a challenging season. Uh, but last week, of course, you were at uh, Carmen, I guess, with the crop diagnostic days happening there. How does everything look? Well, right around us looks very good, Lindsay. Uh, I'm from Carmen, Manitoba which I call the center of the known universe. I always like to tell people, right. that, even though it's a tiny town, they may not have heard of. Uh, uh, but yeah. we have everything around here, those crops that you mentioned, corn and soybeans, but uh, a lot of others. Um, there are three big ones, uh, canola, wheat, and soybeans. And after that, we have oh, a dozen other crops that we grow, including sunflowers, dry edible beans, and those are two of the things I want to talk about tonight. Yeah, absolutely. So before we get into the nitty gritty, do I call them dry beans or do I call them edible beans? Is it a regional difference? Is it just preference? Dave, I'll start with you. What did I call them first? I said dry beans. <laughs> I think so. uh, Is it, that what we go with? It could be either, Lindsay. <laughs> yeah, um, okay. 
I just have to call them something beans because people have yes. taken to calling soybeans beans here. Beans. That's and right. Since we grow and both, we... we have to make the distinction. So absolutely. Yeah, I'd say edible beans. Not that soybean okay. is not edible in one form or another. Edamame. Right. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I do love edamame. Um, Rob, are they edible beans or are they dry beans? Uh, I've heard both. I tend uh, I tend to hear more dry beans lately. Um, mm, you know, I think uh, in the last couple of years, you, we used to say edible beans, and then we kind of shortened it down to edibles. And then a lot yes. of people would ask, wonder what we were actually talking about. So then, right. you know, we kind of said, <laughs> talk more about dry beans now. So it tends right. to be, that's, oh, that's the go-to. Interesting. Okay. We could have a whole other show about yep. <laughs> that. Okay. Anyway, I am squirrel all over the place. All right. Jason vote, uh, votes for dry beans. Um, so there you go. We're talking dry beans versus soybeans. But yes, Dave, you're right. We need to make the distinction. We can't just call them all beans uh, because they are significantly different in a lot of ways, but also, of course, very similar in some. And that's uh, what we'll delve into tonight. So yeah, so tonight we are talking about white mold and sclerotinia. Uh, so sclerotinia, for the most part, this is we talk about this on canola. Um, but it does, of course, impact other crops as well. But it is the same. So Dave, maybe if you can sort of set the scene for us. How many different types of white mold do we have? Is it just the one? Is it the same as sclerotinia? What's the sort of pathology of, of what we're dealing with here? Technically, it's all the same fungus, Lindsay, that affects those crops and others. And it could infect virtually all of the broadleaf crops. Uh, sclerotinia sclerotiorum. There is another species, trifoliorum, which affects uh, clovers and... Okay. Um, hmm, might even be another one that affects potatoes. But for the most part, we're talking about that one, Sclerotinia sclerotiorum. Okay. So, and that's, so sunflowers, canola, dry beans, soybeans, it's all the same pathogen, just yes. call it different things. Yeah, okay. that's right. Okay, okay. And so that of course is going to matter when we start talking about managing this disease because we have to talk about rotation. Now, sure. Rob, yeah, so, but Rob, you're, of course, in the world of, you do rotate, but there's nothing really else in the rotation that you have to worry about, because it's just corn, soy, wheat. That's it. Uh, well, we sometimes do some sunflowers in there, some dry beans. Uh, you know, now All that right. we're starting to play around with winter canola a little bit more, too, you know, that, that brings another host crop there, but... Um, you know, as Dave kind of mentioned, you know, it can affect all broadleaf crops, including weeds. So there's over 400 weed species that are actually susceptible to white mold and actually hosts for white mold as well. So that's a, a oh, nice plug yeah. to control all those broadleaf weeds in your other crops. Mm, Rob it does have a thing for killing weeds. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's, okay, that's a really good point, though. It never, yeah. like, this is endemic, right? It's endemic. Mm -hmm. It can live on so many things. So, I mean... Dave, I'll ask you this question. Is that one of the reasons why this can be a tough to control disease is that it's just, it's everywhere and, and really, I mean, isn't super picky about a host? I don't know, Lindsay. There are lots of reasons that it's difficult to control. Um, but I do want to talk about dry and how long it can survive in the absence of the right environment. Because, okay. you know, you mentioned it around Guelph, it's been dry. Uh, for the last three, going on four years, we've had what we have to call drought in much of Western Canada and in Manitoba. Mm -hmm. And that's unusual for us. You probably remember it's a wetter environment here. Mm -hmm. uh, but we haven't had that for a while. So growers and agronomists at the school last week, they were asking me, can this thing still be around? And of course it can. Uh, those survival mm -hmm. structures are not indestructible, but they can live for a very long time in the soil. Quite happily for four years. If they're within an inch of the soil surface, they'll probably break down within that time. Um, but if they're buried, uh, they, they can be brought up to the surface again. They're sort of in suspended animation down there. And it's when they're within an inch of the surface under wetter conditions where the soil stays wet 24 hours a day for seven to 10 days. That's when we first begin to see these tiny mushroom-like structures called apothecia. And mm -hmm. ascospores begin to blow around. 
So, so this is a key point though, is dry conditions don't necessarily negate the risk entirely. Absolutely not. Yeah. Okay. All right. So Rob, walk us through, and we're going to get to the ASCO spores and all sorts of cool words in a minute, um, but, but walk us through um, the key timing that you're paying attention to. Do you sort of just assume that white mold is going to be a problem in a soybean crop because we are a wetter environment, or do you still take the environment or the weather of the season into play? Yeah, so it's a little bit of both. So it just depends on the season. Obviously, the, the weather and the environment is going to drive it. Uh, we always say manage the crop, not the weather. So if you have you know good yield potential um, for soybeans, you have a history of white mold in that field, those are the ones that you're going to target with that foliar fungicide application. Um, but there's several other factors that you have to do before you even think about fungicide application. Like fungicide should be your last line of defense. And we actually want to make sure that, you know, there's a risk of white mold before we just start doing blanket applications of fungicides. So it's it depends on the year, depends on the field, the field history. Um, you know, every field is different. There's different, you know, crop rotations, soybean variety, tillage, as, as Dave mentioned, you know, in general, we tend to see lower incidences in of white mold in no-till situation because they are closer to the surface versus a conventional till mm, situation okay. when you mixes it up. You know, there's plant population, there's row spacing, fertility, all that all that comes into play. So I'd say, you know, every year is different, but manage the crop, not the weather. If you have good yield potential and you have a, you know, low, even to moderate risk, that's where, you know, the weather can change very quickly. And um, you've probably heard us say, grass is green, white mold's keen. Um, you know, mm -hmm. there, that's a, a saying that we've been using the last few years from our long-term uh, sales rep in the Ottawa Valley, Jerome Gagne. And it means, you know, if you have, if your grass is green going into, you know, the 1st of July into that Canada Day weekend, um, that's where, you know, you've had the right conditions to kind of, you know, get that apothecia and that sclerosis start to, uh, to produce those spores. And that's when the, the timing of the soybeans are really starting to flower at that stage as well. So that's where, you know, if grass is green, white mold's keen going into into July long weekend, you know, that's where you want to consider it on those higher yield potential fields. But, you know, in Guelph area, my grass is pretty brown right now. So, you know, the, the risk would probably be uh, a little bit lower for, for this particular area, but that can change in a, in a matter of a couple of weeks. So Rob, is there a corollary to the gap? Grass is a green, white mold is <laughs> like grass is brown, white mold is down. Yep, yeah. heard that as there, well. Yes. So, yep, that's there the second we component. So. We love rhymes here on this show. Yep. We also love puns, so bring them on. Uh, yeah. It, so okay, so great point, Rob. That obviously we still that we talk about the disease triangle, right? I mean, we yep. know the pathogens there. We know the host is there, but that environment component really does need to be there. Um, Jason Vogt has a question, uh, Dave. What about other soil pathogens and fungi that feed on sclerotia? So do we have some biological help in the field? I should mute myself, to... Lindsay, because... Uh... Yes. <laughs> do you need to... Yeah, do you need to take a call? You should let... Who knows where it is? You should let me answer it, Dave. There we go. It wasn't a call. It was an alarm I'd set for something else. Oh, there you go. Okay. It's, sure. it's <laughs> that's so okay. Take question, your brownies, oh, from take Jason, your brownies oh. out of the oven. Yeah. Right. Um, what about other soil pathogens and fungi that feed on sclerotia? So if they're in mm -hmm. that tub inch, are they at there all There are a lot useful? of beneficials in the soil. And a um, number of things will break down sclerotia. Um, couldn't name them all. There's actinomycetes and things like that. But nevertheless, they're there. And that's the reason that sclerotia don't last forever. They will break down over time. Um, okay. There are things that you can mistake for uh, the apothecia that come up from sclerotia. And one of those is a beneficial that actually breaks down residue of previous crops, including canola. Is that the bird's nest? Is that the that's bird's nest? Fungus? Bird's nest fungus, yeah. I have found it in soybean fields. I actually thought I was like, look at me finding these apathy. Like I open the canopy and like, boom, yeah. right there. And then yeah. I'm like, wait a minute. 
that's not what this is at all. So, but for a moment, I thought I was very yeah. clever. And oh, then, everybody uh, has seen that and yeah. thought that before yeah. the cap, the the nest opens. It yes. looks it's the same color, same size, maybe a little different texture, but otherwise uh, they're very similar. Yeah, it's they a cool are thing. Cool. I hope you'll show a picture of it later on. But yeah, yeah, exactly. It is now. cool. Yeah, no, but yes, it is cool. And I actually I should find the pictures that I took of it because it it does look really cool. Um, Jason asks about the soil pathogens and fungi that feed on sclerotia because he's not convinced of sclerotinia pressure out here. Now, Jason's close to where you are, Dave. Um, I have yet mm -hmm. to see epithesia in wheat and oat fields on last year's canola and sunflowers. Now, could that also potentially be a factor of it being so dry last year? Potentially. Now, Jason is a pro. He's looking in the right places. Yep. We talked about that at the school. And um, for my money, you're looking in those crops that are on canola stubble, but it mm -hmm. could also be on sunflower stubble. Um, that's less common, but sclerotia. A lot more sclerotia can be left behind by a sunflower crop than by mm -hmm. uh, a canola crop. And uh, those dry edible beans, as we're gonna call them, uh, they also can yeah. produce a lot of sclerotia, and those might be around in, in low spots. And I'll okay. remind Jason that the type of spores we're talking about can blow in from some distance away. So yes, uh, the local risk may be lower, but uh, mm -hmm. it's always there and it's waiting for the, the right conditions to infect. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now we do have, this is, I've been very excited in that we've talked about the epithesia and the ascospores um and there is a picture it's it's kind of hard to zoom in on jay was going to try producer jay but if you can bring up the slide that that david sent it's down near the bottom and i don't know if we can zoom in but it honestly looks like the ascospores are smoking but it says chuffing of the ascospores so great band name so i'm claiming it that chuffing ascospores is my new band name. Anyway, um, but like this is <laughs> this is incredible. Like to see that kind of yeah. There you go, Jay. See there, it works. Um, Nobody's going to understand your your reference in the band name. No, please, but that's but... what makes it. That's what makes it so great, Dave. I'll know when I found my people when they're like, I know what an ascospore is. Anyway. Who, I who think, took I this think photo? that I got this picture from Kelly Turkington, who's a okay. zoologist yeah, he, that I've known and been associated with for decades. And yes, uh, he was on just you wouldn't ago. ever see this in the field. It's set up uh, with backlighting to show yes. that the ascospores are actually being not just poof a little bit, but they're actually shot into the air above the, the apothecia and they get up above the canopy too. It's a mm. physical ejection process. And that's how they get caught up in turbulent air and uh, move not just within a field, across the road, quarter mile away. We, we've seen that. Okay. And there next to it is the bird's nest fungus that yes, when it's open, yeah. looks a little different, but when it's closed can be quite similar to the apathesia. Yeah, that one on the middle left, um, mm -hmm. it, you know, when you see that and you don't have the open ones next to it, lots of people make that mistake. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, very cool. Um, anyway, chuffing ascospores. Okay, so so I want to go, we're gonna go to our first clip and then Rob, we're gonna come back to you because this, uh, this one's about soybeans and I do wanna dig in a little bit more on that tillage question, the varieties, but also of course the very important row spacing and plant population question that always comes up in the risk management category. So uh, producer Jay, if you could run our soybean clip, uh, I believe this is with Albert Tenuta um, from a few years ago. Oh no, we're definitely seeing white mold in, in large areas of the province and that. Now, the weather's been great for, for those areas. You know, where we are down here in Ridgetown and into southwestern Ontario, Essex, Kent, and that, it's been hot, it's been drier. 
um, not those frequent rains. So we're just starting to pick up some mold in certain like locations and that but again very little uh, mold down here as of yet uh, other areas that have had these frequent rain showers storms eastern ontario into the areas around london north of london and that definitely seeing white mold and it's been seeing white mold for for a while as well so it has you know today's a perfect day temperatures are moderate we've got overcast you know it's still damp in here all of those are ideal for mold you know, I hear a lot of uh, growers talking about, hey, you know, can I still mm. put on a white mold fungicide? You know, timing is 2.5, but we're at R4, R5. Is it worth a shot? Yeah, so even that timing, you know, the 2.5 that we talk about or have been talking about in the past for general leaf disease control and, and, and that side of things, that may work for some of the foliar leaf diseases um, on, on those. But when we think about white mold, totally different strategy here. You're looking at earlier the better. Those blossoms, those flowers that are developing on the plant, those are the key driver for, for white mold. Those apothecia, those little um, sclerotia that are, are buried in the ground or you see them, they're black, they almost look like rat turds, many growers see, and then you get a little mushroom coming out of those spores that are released go and uh, infect those blossoms. And those blossoms is how the disease starts to develop. And so as you start getting flowers at R1, R1 and a half, that's where the first application would be probably most beneficial and has been most beneficial because you're starting to, you're slowing down that initial infection. And then if needed, say in a year like this or under um, very high um, risk factors, high plant populations, narrow rows, high fertility, all of the good growth, all of that can increase your risk for mold as well. History of white mold in those fields. And then a subsequent application in that R3, maybe a little bit later than that application could would would be helpful in those cases. Um, one of the questions, and we talked about this earlier, um, growers coming in wanting to go at R4, R5, they see the mold there, it's down low, it's infected, it started to gurgle that stem, coming in with a fungicide application at that stage, really, you know, it, it may make you feel well, make you feel good, sleep better at night, but in most cases you've wasted your money in that particular case because think about it, where's that disease developing? It's down low. And so as we try to, um, you apply that fungicide at those late stages like that, it's not getting down there in the first place. And the disease still develops down there. It's still gonna pinch off those stems and, and in many cases kill that stem. So it's really not gonna increase uh, um, yield in that particular case. It might green up the top part of the, the canopy, but overall the, the return on investment is just not there in that case. And we've seen that you know, you know, in 2013 or so, where you know, a few years ago, where we had again another white mold year, where those, you know, many will call them revenge sprays, were applied. And sure, you saw a little bit green on top, but it really didn't pay. There was no benefit at the end on those. Peter Johnson has entered the chat. Um, yes, I used a clip from Albert, Peter because he won't come on my show. Um, that's not true. He'll eventually come on my show. But we have lots of, <laughs> we have lots of Albert clips. Uh, before, uh, Rob, we get into sort of plant populations and row spacings, I do want to, of course, thank our sponsors one more time. Uh, Out of my Canada and our Real Agriculture webinar happening July 19th at uh, 3 p.m. Eastern. And of course, the Mind Your Farm Business podcast brought to you by RBC Royal Bank. The latest episode is on key performance indicators, KPIs. Um, and uh, it's a pretty cool one. It's a really interesting discussion on measuring things, non-financial things to measure the health of your farm business. It is pretty cool. All right. Uh, Warren says, white mold, the revenge of the spray. Okay, Rob, let's start with, I've certainly heard the term revenge spraying on weeds. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know that we hear it as commonly on fungicide passes. But I mean, right now, we're of course, earlier in the crop, that video, I think was from like early August, something like that. That question does come up, though, let's say you did go in at ideal timing, which you can review if you want. But is there any value to later in the season or is it just a revenge spray if you're going in then? Yeah, so once you start to see white mold, it's almost too late. The, and even, you know, your best fungicides out there, you're lucky if you get 50, 60% control. So the flowers are actually that food source for the 
for the uh, for the sclerotia to feed on. And you know, once we start in soybeans, once we start getting past that R3 stage, um, in, and especially into R4, that's really just revenge spraying. A lot of times, you know, once you see it from the road, it's it's too late. The damage is already done. That sclerotia is already choked off that uh, that stem, and it's going to start blocking the translocations. Like it's too late at that stage. So that's why we tend to go the earlier applications during that that flowering stage is you know late R1 early R2 stage, even R2.5, you know, we still have some time here. If we do get a little bit of rain, um, you know, depends on where the soybeans are at, um, but you know, we're, the window's pretty much closing. So we like more earlier applications, but every year we get questions, you know, and like mm -hmm. Albert said in that clip, makes you feel good, might, you know, like you're trying to do something, but it doesn't, usually it doesn't make economical sense once you start seeing it. That's yeah. for soybeans. Dry beans, totally different. Um, you know, I think it's pretty much, you know, uh, at least in Ontario, we have that right environment. You have good yield potential. That first pass at that 20 to 30% to flower, you know, add in your your other product there to control the, the anthracnose if you're at a high risk for that. And then wait and see, monitor um, the weather the next, uh, you know, next 10 days, two weeks to see if it justifies the second application or not. Okay, Dave. Rob has now switched from R1 to R2 to 20 to 30% bloom, <laughs> which is how we count canola. So mm -hmm. is this okay? Are we supposed to switch gears between crops like that as to what the ideal timing is? Do we have to? Well, you have to. Yes, you have to. I'm afraid <laughs> uh, there is nothing comparable to R1 or R2 in describing dry where beans. the canola plant is at. Yeah. But what about dry, dry beans? beans? Okay. Um, I don't know where the dry beans are at. I haven't looked at any. Maybe Jason will chime in and say <laughs> there you what go, they go look, look like right now. I have a friend who's yeah. growing some here, but I haven't been out to see them. I can't tell you where canola is at. It's all over the map yeah. because of our seeding conditions. Some mm, got in yes. early and it's at full bloom, 50% mm, or more. Okay. So um, if you thought the risk was high and you didn't spray, too bad. But lots mm -hmm. of other stuff has been seeded right up to the crop insurance deadline. And so mm -hmm. it's just cabbaging out or beginning to bolt, as we say. The 20% mm -hmm. bloom stage is really critical because that's the time that petals begin to rain down in the canopy. Mm -hmm. And I guess it's unlike um, soybean or dry edible beans because there the flowers stay attached, right? So. Mm -hmm you have that point of infection that's close to the pod. Here in canola, we're worried about the petals that fall down towards almost the base of the plant, because mm -hmm. if they get into, can I hold up my hand and show the axle of a leaf? The leaf stem, axles, you're a, you can where help, there. It's there here. you go. That's yeah. where the <laughs> petals land. Um, yeah. And the ascospores use the sugars that are in petals. Otherwise, they wouldn't have enough energy on their own. To launch an attack. You need sugars, you need free moisture, and those two things accumulate at that axle of the leaf with the stem. And the lower down it is with the canopy, the more destructive it is. The enzymes that the fungus produces chew root right through that uh, stem and it's toast. But then it also takes up space, so you can't mm -hmm. compensate for yield from the plants around it. That's yeah. why we talk about the 20 to 50% bloom stage as an ideal range for canola. You might hold off until the 50% bloom if you feel that the risk is low at the onset of bloom. And then you'll get a better bang for your buck when the ascospores are flying around and infesting those petals before they fall down within the canopy. So, and we have a clip coming up a little bit later that sort of will go over that a little bit more, but even still the visual is really strong that, that you're right. There is a, a structural difference between the soybean and edible bean plants and the, and the canola plant, but mm -hmm. the, the mechanism of feeding off the petals is the same. It is the flower. That yes. is the part you're trying to protect. Uh, sure. But this is where that, that difference in the canopy really matters. And so Rob, this is, I'll ask you, the explanation then on is there an optimal row spacing like we know we need air movement through the canopy we know we don't want uh, but at the same time you also want to be inter intercepting all that sunlight so you want to cover the ground but you also don't want to have 
too many plants. So how do you find that common ground or that middle ground between disease risk and, and max yields? Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, we often get that question and it's mostly, you know, pick the row spacing that's best for your farm. Like there's no one great blanket row spacing. You know, as we go to more, there, more northern climates, we get into, you know, narrower rows, seven and a half, more so 15 inches. You know, down south, we tend to do more 15 and a half or 15 inches and, and 20 inch rows. Um, but it all comes down to that, how quickly they canopy. Um, you know, so manage their population. The earlier planet ones are, can tend to actually be more susceptible. Uh, just because they do canopy a lot more, a lot quicker, and and you know especially around this time of year, that that environment in that canopy is much different than above that canopy. Um, so we've actually done tests later in the season. You know, once we get into August, um, you know, you put those uh, humidity sensors there above and below the canopy, and we're anywhere between 15 and 20 percent difference in terms of relative humidity in mm -hmm. that canopy versus above that canopy. So it's almost like I have hostas in my backyard. You know, there's hostas there you know the ground's still moist um much cooler conditions than right above you know or just outside of where the grass is that's starting to fire up so much different in that canopy so the denser canopy that's where you're you know so that yes row width plant populations but you know if you start doing some some wider rows in the northern climates you're not going to have yield so you might as well not even right. bother you know worrying about that and i will say you actually want to have a little bit of white mold in your soybean crop um, not enough that it causes a yield damage, but that means you've actually had good growing conditions, especially during those reproductive stages. So if you see a little bit of white mold, that means, you know, potentially you can have that, that higher yield potential. I have heard that before, but I will tell you white mold is hideous. So <laughs> Ottawa Valley, you always get Ottawa Valley. Get we always here. get it. <laughs> always get it. You're the, you're the hot spot for, especially it's for soybeans. True. So. And it, and it is, um, like it takes out huge patches. Like yeah. there will be like huge areas that just look awful. Um, so now, and so I guess it's a question and riddle me this, why is it so patchy? Is that the underlying, is it, because it doesn't seem to follow low spots necessarily, which that would sort of make sense, but sometimes it does, but it definitely is patchy. So is that an underlying soil issue, do you think, or soil condition? So, or is it a mystery? To me, I, I think it's just that microclimate in that in that canopy. Yeah. Um, you know, wherever those mushrooms are, those those apothecias are, um, that's where it's going to produce. So if you kind of look at your, I I know I'm referencing the the lawn again, but you know, mushrooms don't grow go throughout your entire yeah. lawn. They grow grow up and and appear in patches. And I think the same thing is is for uh, for for white mold in in the soybeans. Dry beans is totally different, but soybeans, uh, you know, it tends to be a little bit patchy as well. It's not really the widespread mm -hmm. field. Uh, Warren Schneckenberger is blaming my sheep. It is not the sheep. The sheep have nothing to do with white mold. Um, <laughs> Could be the manure. Right. Could be the manure. So. Yeah. Could well, be. What about uh, plant to plant contact? Because mm. um, dry beans, even though we call them that, it's quite a succulent crop. And uh, this fungus can grow over the surface. And when it's causing white mold, they're Wherever there's plant to plant contact, it can move between plants. Now we mm -hmm. rarely, if ever, see that in canola, but I'm suggesting that uh, low Maybe spots wherever, as lo long as you have that really dense canopy that Rob's talking about, you have more plant to plant mm -hmm. contact. So it can just walk through liquefying the, the stems and leaves. Gross, Dave, that was very, <laughs> That's very graphic. Although that does make me think sort of like even wind movement be, it, within a canopy of canola, let's say moving petals between plants. Um, so if you've, there's, I don't know. Anyway, so many things to think about. Um, Jason has a good point about that stagey canola you talked about, Dave. And I did want to shout out Clint Yerke, who's with the Canola Council. He's out in Saskatchewan. Um, he was spraying tonight, actually, because his canola is at that 20 to 30% bloom. Um, so that sort of, I mean, it is sort of all over the map, but that's, we are in that prime window right now. Uh, but Jason says, with stagey canola, is there a need or a benefit to a split application of fungicide? I will caveat this that I'm sure he means full rates, but just at two different times. Is there enough value in the crop or in going in at, at two stages? Because staging the crop can be difficult if it's 
all over the map. Oh, yeah. Sure it is. Um, but the staginess might be because we've had to reseed our canola. And a uh, producer called me last week and he was saying, got a canola crop. It has just cabbage, barely beginning to bolt. But I have quite a few volunteers and or survivors from the first time around right. seeding. Uh, what do I do about spray timing? And I said, perhaps you should uh, try and think about what's going to produce the crop. In this case, unless mm -hmm. they're really plentiful, those volunteers or those escapes or whatever they are, they're not going to um, have the oomph to cause disease in the rest of the crop, right? The petals that mm -hmm. rain down, it's dry on the surface of the canopy. They're not going to cause disease. It's when the bulk of the crop is flowering that, uh, mm -hmm. that you'd be aiming. It's always a hard decision. Nothing ever yeah. blooms uniformly. Mm -hmm. um, and to that point, those escapes or whatever you want to call them, um, they're not going to really add to yield either, right? So no. you're not right. pr protecting them. And if they're not going to contribute a lot to mm -hmm. disease necessarily, then, yeah. then really you have to go with the bulk of the crop for sure. Um, right. Right. Sharing is caring. Now, so Peter Johnson and Peter, welcome back. We are very glad to have you. I hope you had a great trip. Uh, question for you, Rob, is humidity enough to cause white mold or do we need rain? Uh, it looks like tar spot may just be humidity and that we'll probably tackle that in an upcoming episode. But um, do we need rain or is is a very humid canopy enough to spur this disease on? Yeah, so I think it, it they kind of go go along with each other. You actually need the moisture and the rain to start the process, um, you know, especially in that canopy. And and with the relative humidity work that we did, you know, we actually saw greater separation um, with the uh, the aquaspores about two three days after that rain event. Because when it rains, you know, both temperatures above the you know in the canopy and above the canopy are both 100%. But two, three days afterwards, that's where, you know, you start to see the differences in that canopy. Mm. So you, you need moisture, moderate temperatures. You know, white mold doesn't like the really hot, humid days. Um, you know, once you get over, you know, 25, 28 degrees Celsius, it tends to shut down. Um, but it comes down to you need moisture uh, and rain to actually begin that process. And then it also comes down to leaf wetness. So tar spot, it's it's relative humi humidity, but it's also uh, leaf wetness that's driving that. And you need the, the rain there, that rainfall event to actually create those those heavy dews and then that, that build that environment in there. Okay. So they go hand um, in hand. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I want to, uh, Producer Jay, can you bring up, I think it's slide six of Rob's with Phomopsis. And I want to talk about tank mixes too, but why do we also yep. have to talk about Phomopsis? Yep. So Phomopsis is one of those diseases that we're starting to see across Ontario, um, also known as pod and stem blight. Um, very similar. It's the same. Uh, I forget the scientific name right now, but it's basically the same asexual stage. And uh, Phomopsis is, we're starting to see it in pockets. We saw it in the Ottawa Valley about two, three years ago. We tend to get it down in Essex a little bit. And you know, it's sometimes confused with uh, anthracnose on the on the beans, and it tends okay. to be a little bit later in the season. Um, so, Phomopsis, if you look at that top photo there, it has those black dots, those those spores, um, the apothecia, um, sorry, not the apothecia, um, the pycnidia, all mm -hmm. in the same line, and that's where you know it's starting to see, and it tends to affect more the uh, the pods and the the seed quality. And the thing is, with what I want to mention, this is with fungicides. Um, tend to see better responses to later applications. So more in that R3, R4 stage. So that's where if you're at a higher risk of white mold, um, so maybe in the Ottawa Valley, in the Quebec for, for this season, um, you know, that's where if you do your first application, but the second application, you also manage the white mold, but also that's where you tend to get a greater response on this, um, on, mm. on Phomopsis, which tends to become an issue. I think a couple of the, the newer, you know, not all of them by, by any means, but there are some soybean varieties that are a little bit more susceptible to it. And that's where we're seeing differences. And actually in our research trials, we actually harvest the entire stem 
put it in in the shop or uh, for about three four months and then actually pull them out and do the evaluations on it because it's much easier to see those lines later in the season or even mm. you know a couple months after harvest versus uh versus during the season but definitely uh it is something that should be on our radar but it's not widespread it's just every year there's always pockets okay very cool um now dave walk me through for manitoba obviously soybeans are are grown there as well as these dry beans is is white mold and dry beans the biggest risk on the disease front or are there other ones that take precedence over white mold hmm. i guess i'd have to say that yes it is the number one disease concern in dry beans here um, we have not seen anthracnose to the extent that we did um, some years ago when i first started mm -hmm. working in manitoba it was a concern then. It doesn't seem to be now. Uh, we have from time to time seen some rust, um, but that's only in certain classes of beans. Mm -hmm. um, Jason has probably instructed me about this uh, more than anyone. Uh, and what else? Uh, there are root rots that we're concerned about, of course. Yeah. Yep, yeah, for sure. Um, I just, I wonder with Manitoba, I've, I mean, Obviously, it's a grows a lot of canola, but also grows soybeans, also grows dry beans, also grows sunflowers. I mean, you just can't get away from it. So I just I would assume it would be the highest risk disease in in dry beans. But you yeah. know what they say about assuming. Yeah. So yeah. Yes. I anyway. Do. <laughs> yes. All right. Um, okay. I want to switch gears just a little bit and head to uh, to our second clip of the night. Uh, shout out to Holly Dirksen, who is in this one. I um, I have shared this before, not this clip, but I've shared before that for some reason, I tended to interview her when she was very heavily pregnant. And this is uh, no different. And um, this is, we've been talking about staging the crop. So she's going to show us um, how to stage the canola crop, which is probably what a lot of producers are looking at right now. So producer Jay, if you can run this canola school with Holly Dirksen from several years ago. It's time, or maybe a little late, but to talk about sclerotinia control. So two things, what's the optimal time to be uh, protecting this crop? and uh, show us how to establish that. And then I've got a few other questions for you. Okay, so with sclerotinia, you are targeting the petals of the plant. So although you see infection on the stems, that, step that, that infection arose from the petals. So the petals were infected or either became infected after they, fe after they fell, um, and that's where the spore infected and then the infection spread to the stem. So you're looking at the 20 to 30% flowering timing as being your ideal stage uh, for sclerotinia, sclerotinia control, definitely before 50%. And I'll probably talk about that later, but why you want to get in there before 50%. Um, but the best way to assess what your flowering stage is, and you know, wise and maybe agronomists can tell from the roadside, but for new agronomists and anyone who wants to double check, you need to get out there, you need to go to a couple of spots in the field and count the number of open flowers on the main stem. So you would take a plant, see if I can pull this one up. You're gonna peel away any of the side stems and then you're gonna count either an open flower or anything that used to be a flower. So these pods down here, you'd count them as well. Um, so we'll count on this plant. I counted earlier, but I'm pretty sure we're at about 20. So 20 open flowers would be about 30% flowering. So we say 10 open flowers, about 10%, 15, 20%, 20, 30% or thereabouts. There's a range, obviously. Um, so you want to do that to a number of plants in the field in different spots to get an average. Um, when we look at this field overall, chances are you're not at 30% on most of the plants. So you're probably still a day or two away um, from that ideal timing. And again, when it's hot and dry, things can progress pretty quickly. Uh, so you want to make sure that you're going out every day to assess your, your timing to make sure you're getting it at the right stage. And you also want to, when you're walking through, you can be assessing the humidity and how much free moisture is out there because that too will contribute to your risk for sclerotinia. So it's very much dependent on the microclimate. What's the soil moisture like? Um, is it wet enough for those spores to be produced and infect the petals? 
Based on how wet my feet are, I would say yes. <laughs> okay, there you go. Now you know. <laughs> so, yeah. Which is very nice because it is 30 degrees out. Yeah. And nice and cool on my feet. So, now why, let's talk about why we're aiming to protect this plant at 20 to 30 percent bloom. Why right. at 50 percent are we wasting our money? So as you can see, if we're at like 20% bloom now, the canopy has really started to fill in. Um, and so a 20% bloom or 30% bloom, you're probably still at a point where when these petals fall, they're gonna be landing on lower portions of the stems. But as that canopy begins to fill in even more, so once you get to 50% bloom and later, yes, there are still petals there. Yes, they can still be infected, but when they fall, they're really gonna be landing on the upper leaf axles. And when you have infection this high in the stem, it's unlikely to cause a big yield effect. It's when you have infection really low that your whole main stem is being wiped out that you're gonna see a big yield difference. So although you may still see infection past that 50% bloom timing, uh, that isn't going to have an effect on the yield like it is at that earlier timing. I uh, can smell the field. Okay, um, I do miss canola. There's some up this way. All right, before we get rolling here for our last part of tonight is just flying by. I did want to, of course, send a shout out to our show sponsors, to Adam Canada, to Mind Your Farm Business, and to our upcoming Real Agriculture webinar, uh, Prosperity Through Trade Infrastructure Investment, happening July 19th at 3 p.m. Eastern. This is with Carlo Dade and John Law of uh, the Canada West Foundation. Uh, head on over to realagriculture.com slash webinar. Uh, make sure you register and take that in. It'll be uh, pretty cool. Okay. Uh, so Canadian cowman. So Kevin says, shoot between fungus and insects. You guys are making dairy farming sound easy. Um, if you have robots, then I would agree. Um, but maybe, maybe if you still have a parlor, maybe not. Anyway, just kidding. Dairy farming is difficult. Um, all right, but the cows are so much fun, don't you think? Okay, all right. Uh, Rob, I wanted to start, there's a question here from Peter, and then Dave, I wanna ask you, um, or talk a little bit about sclerotinia versus black leg. Um, and then I do wanna touch on uh, varieties as well. I wanna talk about genetics for a bit. But Rob, uh, the question is, thoughts on apps like Sporecaster for, for predicting the need for sprays? Do we depend on them? Are they in addition to? How good do we have it here in Ontario? Yeah, so I've I've used Sporecaster a little bit. I don't say, I wouldn't say I use it on a regular basis, but with any of these apps, you know, Tarspotter, Sporecaster, and everything, uh, Doncast as well, I would say it, they're good to be, to use them as a guideline, um, but don't set, you know, don't just go out and say, okay, Sporecaster says I'm at high risk, so let's spray every field. So it has to be a, a field by field uh, basis and even, you know, just even different parts of the field. Like you might not have to spray this, the sandy knolls on top if you are targeting a disease such as white mold because lower yield potential, there's a little bit more air movement on, on top of some of the hills. So that's where, you know, they're, they're great tools, uh, but it still doesn't replace uh, boots on the ground and you still have to, you know, go by what's, uh, what's in your backyard. Mm -hmm. Now, Dave, in Manitoba, so I know there certainly the provinces put out fusarium risk maps. There's some wheat midge maps. What do what do Manitoba producers have potentially for risk mapping uh, on the disease front? For sclerotinia, I'm afraid they don't have risk maps. It's more a gut feel, Lindsay. Um, yeah. We have tried in the past to do risk forecast maps for sclerotinia and found that it is just so... Um, if not field specific, then small area specific. Mm -hmm. The types of rainfall that we get here, it's this continental weather patterns where we have intense showers. So Elm Creek right now is uh, underwater, even from last night and from earlier on. And Carmen here, we're in the sweet spot, uh, just 100% mm -hmm. of long-term moisture and the crops look pretty good, as I said earlier. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, you were going to ask me about black leg and sclerotinia yes. on the same crop. Yeah. Well, um, they're usually uh, competing for number one and number two as the most important disease for canola. Mm -hmm. But recently, I have to say that uh, black leg has been winning. And 
in some ways okay. it's because it's insidious. Um, even if a crop or a variety has resistance, um, the time that that resistance expresses itself can vary. And mm -hmm. we survey 150, 160 canola crops a year. And last year, even in spite of the drought, we found some black leg in 85% of the fields, nearly all of them. Wow. And in those fields, um, some of them as bad as 50% of the plants showing symptoms, but usually in the um, one to 30% infection. And then wow. you cut those open and look at the severity of severity, the disease. Yeah. yeah, it's sort of hidden. It's not appreciated in the same way. Um, when it's wetter, then things, uh, they go advantage sclerotinia. But you can have both diseases occurring at the same time. And I have found this occasionally at our diagnostic school, for instance, side by side leaf lesions that are sclerotinia. They're usually crater like. Again, it's the enzymes that the fungus produces that just okay. destroy all cell walls and hit this collapse. But you'll al almost always find a fallen flower part, not necessarily right. a petal, sometimes a stamen. Um, that doesn't have to be the case at all for black leg. That is from an ascospore landing there, starting a new lesion. Um, black leg lesions on leaves can be a little bit crater-like, but primarily the giveaway symptom is um, a lot of pycnidia. Right, little the that little like black dots. dots. Of pepper. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And those are asexual structures. Um, you get movement from them. When it's wet, the, the pycnidia ooze, and those spores are spread by rain splash, so short distances. But from a black leg infection on a leaf, if it's close to the uh, midrib, it'll work its way down the petiole into the stem. It's a guarantee. And uh, that can, can cause some, some real problems. Maybe we don't see um, big yield losses, but as my colleague, Dane Fraze, was arguing at our diagnostic school, yeah, sure, maybe you're getting 50 bushels of canola, but you don't know if you might have been getting 60 because you're not right. looking at how important black leg is in, in the crop. So when when I'm scouting, and they certainly, the the they can look similar, The certainly, the but am I looking, do they happen on the same part of the plant as far as the depth of the canopy would i be looking for black leg lower in the canopy and mm. then sclerotinia or do they happen in the same depth well the ones that are going to cause problems for the plant are both found lower in the canopy like uh, leaves two three four um, i mean the disease can get black leg can get going as early as a uh, cotyledon stage but those will be dried up by the time you're looking. And usually it's it's those lower leaves where you'll find black leg lesions if they're, if they're gonna be there. Um, mm -hmm. Dan and I were in a canola field just last week, which was two years after canola. So that's a high risk situation. And uh, though it's a variety that had uh, moderate resistance or rated R, you could still find black leg lesions on the leaves. And so it's going to have an impact. Yeah. Um, you win for most um, words that have made me go, ew, in an episode. Oh, so no. thank $2 you for that. Words. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Ooh. Anyway, hmm. no, but it. I bet these are important things to understand, though, of course, is how these diseases spread, um, whether or not rain splash is an issue, whether or not plant to plant uh, transmission can happen, which, of course, we've established can. And now you have mentioned, of course, in talking about black leg, um, having those resistant lines. Rob, where are we at when we're into variety selection? We can focus on soybeans. Do we have really good options when it comes to white mold or is there a range? Are there some that are just really poor? Where do we stack up? Yeah, I think definitely there's there's a range. Um, we're starting to probably eliminate the ones that are highly susceptible, but I think a lot of the ones, you know, historically when it starts, the soybean varieties that tend to branch out a little bit more, tend to be more, you know, 
that thicker canopy, that perfect environment for the disease to develop, they tend to be um, a little bit more susceptible to to white mold. So there's definitely different different genetics play a role, but even just how the the orientation of the soybean variety, and you know that's really important to understand when you are picking your populations or your row width as well, how that variety mm-hmm. does does perform. But um, you know we we typically would would use the same old uh, varieties from about 10 years ago, um, you know, that were always very susceptible and you pretty much, you know, it, it's really tough to do small plot research on it. Cause like we said, it is very patchy in the field. So it's really rare to get an entire experiment that's uniform. Um, even when you irrigate and inoculate and everything like that, you could do everything you want, but if you don't have the, the, you know, if, if the temperature is too warm or something like that, you don't get that uniform coverage across that entire field area. So mm-hmm. that's where, you know, soybean genetics have definitely improved and we've kind of gone away with some of the, uh, the ones that, you know, don't are more susceptible to it. Interesting that plant architecture plays such a role in it. I mean, it makes sense, obviously, when you think about how it works with the, with the humidity and the canopy, but that's a uh, pretty fascinating. Dave, where are we at with Western Canada with our canola varieties? Do we have decent selection? Do we have any? Do we have none? Hmm. Um, There's been a lot of discussion uh, among the Canola Council and the experts in Western Canada about what they can do about uh, resistance development in the canola crop. I uh, I hate to say I'm skeptical, but uh, I always tell my students at these schools that this fungus is a primitive fungus. It's highly destructive. It doesn't give a crap whether it kills the plant or not. Right. If it can, it's going to. So it's it's really destructive. There is no gene for gene interaction as there is right. with black leg or phytophthora in soybeans, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so how can the plant survive? Architecture is one thing. Um, Some growers here in Manitoba have even experimented with the wider row spacing of canola, like up to 30 inches, like a row crop. And that's, uh, I think that's completely ridiculous, but uh, I don't know. (laughs) But did it work, Dave? (laughs) It's only only ridiculous if it didn't work. Right. Let's see if Jason has any comments about that. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Where's Jason? Can we talk about uh, sunflowers for a minute? Yes, absolutely. Along the yes. But I, I noticed no, that that's okay. We got time. We Pete is interested enough that he said and I yes. quote Yeah, um, sunflowers are horrid, horrid for white mold, he said. Mold. Horrid. Yes. Is okay, it? and here here is why. Okay. Sunflowers can get infected in two different ways and at three different mm. times. The <gasps> second way is those resting bodies, those sclerotia, they don't germinate as apothecia, they germinate another way. And that's in response to germinating sunflower plants. They give off an exudate, uh, sugar that spreads out into the soil is a rough way of describing it. And it causes the sclerotia to germinate, not as apothecia, but as mycelium. So that's the vegetative stage of the fungus. It grows straight into the root then and begins to work its way up the stem. And you don't see that till later, but it's going to weaken the stem much, as much that the plant is going to flop right over before the end of the season. The other two ways are both through ascospores. The one happens mid-season, and that's when you get some kind of uh, physical injury on the stalk. Could be from hail, could be from birds, could be from insects, uh, stem mining insects. Any of those things cause the stem to bleed sugars, uh, which is, again, one of the things that the ascospores need. Mm -hmm. So we can get midstock rot, and then it flops over from the middle. But the absolute worst is head rot, because it happens so late in the season. And then it's using the ray flowers of the head to work its way in. Uh, Those flowers don't fall off, of course. And you can get the fungus completely destroying the head. At the end, all you'll see is uh, like a broom, a dry broom. Um, Sometimes if it's still intact, you'll see masses of sclerotia on the face. And sometimes pull those off, turn them over. It's like a carton of eggs, or pardon me, an egg carton, just an empty egg carton. 
And those will break up, of course, and they'll be more likely to break down quickly in the soil, but they are the survival mm -hmm. structures nevertheless. And again, not being able to spray really to control that kind of thing. You may have had a beautiful crop growing all along and it's now late in the season and suddenly it's wet and it stays wet. You can lose quite a bit to head rot. So there's, I mean, you'd have to fly it on, but there, is it just that there's nothing that can stop it at that point when we're talking about the head rot? Well, there's, uh, every fungicide is used prophylactically, right? Right, you so have you have to, to be ahead of it. Yes, yeah. you do. And it's almost like you have to anticipate what's there. And yes, I think that most of it would be uh, aerial applied. There really isn't a way to get even no. a good high clearance sprayer over uh, a sunflower crop. So, yeah. yeah. And so the, yeah, and the stock rot, that's that. So it can come straight from the bottom or it can start in the mm -hmm. mid or the head. Yeah. Yeah. Poor sunflowers. They're the happiest crop, Dave. Why would you do They're this? Beautiful. Anyway. We get uh, <laughs> we get city people trampling the sunflowers yes. because they want the photo ops along the highway. I know. So, and Rob, you probably saw this in the news too. We yep. had just recently here in Ontario, we had a farmer's field of canola, which is much more rare in Ontario. There's not many fields of canola, but it was inundated with tourists taking selfies in the you canola field. Kidding. Oh no, and it and the OPP actually put out a tweet and a, and said like call us. This is trespassing. You can let yeah. us know that people are doing this. Um, anyway, so can just we put out an electric wire around these. Like, <laughs> these now I happen to know that there are some farms that do that they do grow the sunflowers on purpose and they yep. they actually welcome people to come. Mm, yeah, and but sure. they they make that very known that that's why it's there. Mm -hmm. It's there for pictures. Please, no one trample farmer's fields and walk through them anyway um yes hideous okay and but we are out of time um we have covered a, a lot tonight there's still so much more we could talk about this is one of those diseases that uh, i think we have summed up tonight just how difficult it is for sure um and so rob thank you so much great point i'm glad you got it in there about controlling the other the weeds that are alternate hosts. weeds yep <laughs> yeah way to slide that one in there try to try to stay ahead of it <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, Rob, thanks so much. And Dave Kaminsky, yep. thank you so much for joining me on the show. It's your first time on The Agronomist. It won't be the last, just so you know. Oh, I see. It was a pleasure. <laughs> thanks for being gentle with me. <laughs> with my phone going off. Midstream. No, that's okay. Just make sure you get the cookies out of the oven. All right. All right. And thank you to everyone, of course, for being uh, here to here to watch the show. Uh, Sean did mention this is the 75th episode of The Agronomist, which is pretty cool. Uh, time flies when you're having fun, so they say. Uh, shout out, of course, to our show sponsors, to Adam at Canada, uh, to Mind Your Farm Business, and, of course, the July 19th webinar coming up uh, here on Real Agriculture. Thank you to everyone. Head on over to realagriculture.com slash agronomist to more and get those CU credits. And next week, uh, kind of a special week, Kara Oosterhouse will be hosting and the topic is on irrigation. So all sorts of really cool stuff. I hope you'll join us uh, and we'll see you then. Cheers, everybody.